It's a bonus edition of the Fina Mendoza Mysteries. I'm Kitty Feldy, the host and creator of the show, and we wanted to take you backstage to the making of the podcast. Oh, that was great. It was great working with her. Oh, I guess and then okay. working with her again now. She has a beautiful voice, too. I've heard her do offer in ballet class. <laughs> All right, one more time from the top. The box, right? The ornaments. They aren't just cars. You noticed. They're dogs and cats, too. Right on time, you two. What's the big mystery, Claudia? I got Oh, the... I'm sorry, I screwed that one up. Right on time, you oh, two. Oh, and he caught. <laughs> Get it out. Ornament. <clears throat> Black cat, yellow eyes. Of course, it's not exactly the same size so as... So we gotta wait, because we've got an airplane. Actually, we'll probably do this on stage. Let's so skip to do, the come end. On up. Should I go get my script? Because I left at the... I'll give you my... Oh, okay. You, we'll, yeah, you can borrow somebody's. Anyway. Okay. Hat on the National Mall table. And that's why he jumped up there and took a bite out of... Where did DC come from? The man in here? Well, yeah. Why shouldn't we make him? Yeah, where's the nearest pizza place? <laughs> Perfect! Brilliant! So, we'll get it all done before August 12th. All right. So, so thank, it's you. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. I came for my sweatshirt. Okay, so it's a super cool sweatshirt. It doesn't really. Thanks to our cast of the Fina Mendoza Mysteries, including Amy Solano, Monica Vigil, Raul Garza, Linda Graves, Christine Avila, Elizabeth Logan, Rosalie Huntington, Brian Bland, and Steve Dvorkin as Senator Something. You can read more about the show at our website, FinaMendozaMysteries.com. The Fina Mendoza Mysteries is based on the award-winning book, Welcome to Washington, Fina Mendoza, by Kitty Feldy, published by Black Rose Writing. I'm Kitty Feldy. Thanks so much for listening. We'll do it one more time. Okay, good. 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 We'll do it one more time. Hello, I'm Susan Vallett, longtime public radio journalist based in Los Angeles and podcast host and producer of Quantum Magazine's Science Podcast. You might have heard some of my work on KQED's The California Report in the Bay Area. Many thanks to the Bay Area Book Festival for inviting us to this year's Unbound Virtual Fest. We're looking at how books end up in your ears. Not audiobooks, but an episodic podcast based on a novel. This novel is a middle grade mystery set on Capitol Hill. Welcome to Washington, Fina Mendoza, by public radio veteran and my former co-worker, Kitty Feldy. It's the story of the 10-year-old daughter of a congressman from California who moves to D.C. and solves the mystery of the demon cat of mm. Capitol Hill. Kitty, why this story? Well, I spent a lot of time in Washington, D.C., on Capitol Hill, covering Congress for uh, KPCC, public radio station in Los Angeles. And... I was surprised at how different the culture, um, the rules, all kinds of things were so different than they were in California. And I kept telling people stories about them, like uh, DC has the ugliest shoes in America. And they do. They really do. And every, every shoe I brought with me to Washington, DC, I couldn't wear because either it had a heel or they were lime green mules, which no one would ever wear in Washington, DC, or, um, you know, you walk on really uneven surfaces, so you have to have something you can walk in. So their answer to ugly shoes was this round nose ballerina flat with a buckle across the front. And it just cracked me up so much. I started a Twitter account to you know, tell people of, about the ugly shoes on Capitol Hill. So I had all these great stories. And then people sort of got tired of listening to all these stories. So I wanted to share the culture of Washington, D.C., 
and also kind of inspire that next generation of kids to think about public service. And so that's the basic idea. And Fina Mendoza sort of sprung to life on the page. And that's how, that's why I wrote the book. And have, have you always been interested in children's books? I have. I used to work at a library. It was my first job when I was a kid. And my favorite genre to read is um, middle grade novels. I think they're really wonderful. Um, They're not uh, wild and racy like young adult. And they're, you know, you're past the age of picture books. This is a really wonderful genre that really wasn't around when I was a kid. And I love reading them. And I knew that this was the age group I really wanted to reach. Kids in fourth, fifth, sixth grade. And yeah, I totally agree with you. I tend to read like middle school sort of um, fantasy stuff. Um, It's a great escape because they're so simple and it reminds you of such a simple time. Um, I was curious though, um, why, like, was the cat based on somebody in particular in your household? (laughs) (laughs) No, I do have a cat, but um, she's not that demonic. She's just demanding, I think is the best way to describe her. But there is a myth on Washington, on Capitol Hill, that there is, Every Halloween, you read stories about the demon cat of Capitol Hill, and it's this cat that if you see it in the U.S. Capitol, and it's, it hangs out in, the, in the, what I think of as the basement, the crypt area where they were supposed to bury George Washington. And if you see this cat, it's a black cat, and it grows to the size of like a school bus with glowing yellow eyes, and it hisses and spits, and you are cursed, of course, with bad luck. So if you're a politician, you lose your election. Somebody supposedly saw it before the stock market crashed. So this was sort of the story. And um, Fina, in my book, um, sees the cat, or she thinks it's the demon cat, and suddenly bad things start happening to her family. And so she thinks she's been cursed by the demon cat, and she has to solve that mystery. And how did you come about with the idea of turning this into a podcast? Well, the book came out in 2019. And, um, you know, I got to do school visits, and I got to go to book festivals. And it was really a wonderful experience. But I felt like the characters were still hanging around with me. And I wanted to help bring them to life in a different way. And since I left public radio, I've been doing podcasting. I do the Book Club for Kids podcast, where we talk about middle grade novels with a bunch of kids. And I thought, well, okay, I know how to do audio. I know how to write plays. I bet I could write an audio play. And so I adapted it. I really wanted to see if we could, you know, put Fina in your ears, so to speak. And so wrote the script and thought about who could I find to play these characters and found some of the most wonderful actors on planet Earth. And we taped it last summer um, in places that sounded just like the U.S. Capitol and put it all together and released it in October. And when it comes to the writing process, how is writing for the ear different than just writing the normal novel? Well, you don't have things like, um, you know, he said, she said, obviously, because we're hearing it. Um, But I had to find ways in some, I had to look for a different way to do something. So for example, the beginning of the book, Fina's wandering around the crypt and she's feeling kind of nervous and scared. And I didn't want to do an internal monologue. To me, that's too much like, an audiobook, quite frankly, I wanted us to be with her and experiencing what was going on. And I didn't want her to suddenly go into a monologue out of Hamlet. So my solution for doing that was to try to, um, I picked one of the statues that is in the crypt. This this is this creepy room and it's surrounded by some of the founding fathers. So I picked one of the founding fathers and had him come to life, not really, but in her imagination as she's fearful, she's hearing the voice of this statue you know, basically accusing her of being a chicken and not a chick chicken, but, a, um, you know, scared of being afraid to be there. And so we got to hear what was going on inside of her head without actually doing that in a theatrical way to do it more in a realistic way. Where really a, a, an audio, a traditional audio book is just somebody reading the book to you. And this is not that. Yeah, it isn't. I mean, now a lot of publishers have been hiring more than one actor to do the readings. And if you have a really wonderful audiobook um, narrator, they will play all of the parts and you'll feel like you were hearing all of them. But there's still an experience that you're in a book. And what I really wanted to do was to take the listener into the crypt, you know, into the um, to the house of the Mendoza family. Um, to, you know, I really want them to experience it as we are experiencing um, the story with the main character. 
And you did this in a different way. So I, one of the, I teach a college audio production class, and we do audiobooks, and we do radio plays, but we always do them, you know, in the classroom or in a studio, wherever we are. Mm -hmm. You did this in a different way. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, no, there's some wonderful audio dramas out there. It's, um, it's almost like a, you know, a rebirth of this genre that you know, our grandparents used to listen to on the radio, and now they're coming out as podcasts. And there's a lot of them that are geared towards younger listeners. Most of them are taped inside of a studio, a professional audio studio, and then they will sweeten it afterwards, you know, take out every single flaw. They will um, add music and a lot of sound effects. And they're the kinds of sound effects you can download on your computer and, you know, mix them in. And they're big, you know, they kind of sound more like movies. You know, there's that kind of boom and explosions and things like that. And again, I didn't want to do that. I wanted this to be as realistic as possible. And so our solution for doing that was to do what we used to do as public radio reporters. You take your microphone outside. You know, if you were at a protest, you'd get the sound of the protest right there. So what we did was we went outside. If Fina and her dad were walking home and they were crunching through leaves, we found a sidewalk with a bunch of crunchy leaves and that was our sound. We found um, that the clubhouse where I live has hard surface floors and very high ceilings and a nice echo. And it really sounded like the Capitol Crypt. So, you know, we are, again, taking our audience out to where the action was. We went to the zoo to try to recapture that sound of the National Zoo. Of course, we did it in Los Angeles, and it was a day when it was 102 degrees, and all of the animals were asleep, but there were screaming kids. You know, it was just perfect to create that kind of atmosphere. And then the last scene takes place at the lighting of the Capitol Christmas tree. And we taped that at a jazz concert. We borrowed the microphones and borrowed the audience and conned a few people into singing Christmas carols. And so, again, trying to recreate the reality with just a little bit of fiction. And the podcast, which is called The Fina Mendoza Mysteries, um, also includes a lot of kids. What was it like working with kid actors in this type of a setting? They were so professional, you know, they came in prepared, they came early, you know, they were ready to work, they were ready to try things, they came up with some of the best sound effects that we used, you know, oh no, if you're going to drop the backpack, it'll sound more like this, okay, you guys are the experts, we'll do it that way, um, and we'll talk in a minute to our star of the show, Amy Solano, because she was not the kid, but she's had one who had more interaction with those kids than anybody else. So I have a question that's going to take us just a little bit off, but given that we, a lot of us have spent a lot of times indoors recently yeah. over the past few months, um, including those with kids. So I was wondering what you would think FINA would be doing during lock, a coronavirus lockdown. Gosh, funny you should ask. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Susan, we asked the same question and um, it occurred to me that Fina was locked down too. And I didn't want to ignore that situation, particularly since there's a bunch of kids. And so that's what we have is um, a little mini drama, a standalone episode, Fina's Coronavirus Diary. And her teacher assigned all the kids in her classroom to keep a daily diary so that they can um, report on what life was like in a pandemic. And in that episode, she chats a bit with, um, uh, with uh, her favorite animal in the entire world, Senator something, the dog that is her Dr. Watson, so to speak. Um, she, um, you know, she chats with um, the woman who pretty much runs her dad's office and gets information on what her dad's up to. So we kind of find out what Congress is debating and, at, you know, they're debating about whether or not they actually had to show up and cast votes. And so here again in the episode, we're learning not only about FINA, but also about the way the government works and what's going on in Washington, D.C. And that's also available. And because it was, uh, we wanted to have some curriculum to go with it. So we actually have a curriculum sheet and we have a, um, a, an actual diary template that you can download and start your own coronavirus diary as well. And so upon release of stay-at-home orders, where do you think Fina, will, like what's the first place you think Fina might go? I don't know. I'm going to ask Amy Solano that question. Let's 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 talk to these wonderful <laughs> actors. They've been joining us and sitting so patiently while I talk about me. Um, let, me let me introduce a few of them to you, Susan. Um, as I said, our leading lady is Amy Solano. Now I have to do something here because I'm running this as well. I'm going to 
I'm going to, uh, yes, ask to unmute, ask to unmute. There we go. Are you guys with us? We'll yep. hear their voices in a minute. So uh, we'll start with Amy Solano. Um, she is our 10-year-old heroine. Not really. She's not only a wonderful actress, but a gorgeous singer as well. She played the ingenue in a production of Lin-Manuel Miranda's musical In the Heights. And that's where I saw her and went, oh, yeah, that, that, my, hmm, I want her. I want her. She's also been in productions of Fiddler on the Roof and Pirates of Penzance. Amy, thanks for joining us today. Hello. <laughs> and our Dr. Watson character is a giant orange dog. And his name is Senator something. And when I was casting, I immediately thought of the funniest improv actor I know. And that is Steve Dvorkin. Steve, nice to see you. <laughs> oh, 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 excuse me. Excuse me. I'm bark lingual. So I just started <laughs> talking as a dog. I got so used to it. Thank you. Thank you, Kitty, for remembering me because most people in this society has, have forgotten about me years ago. <laughs> Not true. And Fina's congressman father is played by Raul Garza, whose creative background includes performing with a Latino theater company and producing a Spanish language radio talk show. And he actually has some political experience. Raul once served as a city commissioner. Welcome, Commissioner Garza. Thank you. Very nice to be here. <laughs> And I play the role of Miss Greenwood, the teacher. Cannot forget that. <laughs> I'm sorry, Susan, you are correct. Um, and we also know that you can hear the entire eight-part series online at FinaMendozaMysteries.com, or you can download it at Apple or Google Podcasts or Spotify, wherever you listen to podcasts. But we've got this wonderful actors here, Kitty. Can we hear a few scenes from the story? Yes, I think we'll have to make them do some acting here just for us today. Um, well, let's start with a scene where Fina encounters a mysterious creature. It takes place inside the U.S. Capitol with her congressman father. And Fina, by the way, as background, just got a job walking a congressional dog. And this is what happened on Capitol Hill. People bring their dogs to work. It's very odd. You're walking down the halls of one of the house office buildings and, you know, there's a giant poodle and there's a schnauzer. And anyway, Fina gets this job walking a giant orange Briard dog. So let's hear from uh, Amy. Oh, excuse me. Let's hear from Fina and her father, the congressman. Fina, Fine, I'm on my way to vote. Want to come? Of course. I hear you've made a new friend on the Hill. I think it was President Truman who said, if you want a friend in Washington, get a dog. Seems like that's exactly what you did. Congressman Mitchell says you were very kind to her canine. Papa, she paid me $5. That's okay. You only get into trouble around here if you paid her $5. She offered me a job, $5 a day to walk Senator something after school. Senator something? That's his name, the dog's name. Every day, Fina? Let me see. $5 a day times maybe four days a week. By Christmas, I have enough money to fly Trina out for a visit. She could see real snow for the first time. Well, speaking of snow, it's going to be really cold walking that dog once winter gets here. I'd be getting lots of exercise with all that walking. What about homework? I can do both, no problem. Taking care of a dog is a big responsibility, Fina. Just because I misplaced my sweatshirt. Well, lost it twice. That doesn't mean I'm not responsible. Please, Papa. Okay, three conditions. One, you check in first thing at my office right after school. Two, you only walk the dog on Capitol Hill property where the guys in uniform can keep an eye on you. Three, you use your dog walking money to replace your lost sweatshirt. Agreed? Agreed. Papa, have you ever heard of the demon cat? Uh, is that a movie you want to go see? No. The Demon Cat, Capitol Hill, it's really, really bad luck. Fina, there's no such thing as a Demon Cat of Capitol Hill. You were going to say that. Someone's just trying to trick you. Ba -ba -ba. Come on, I need a short visit with Mr. Churchill. 
Why do you do that, Papa? Touch his nose? For luck. We are still masters of our fate. We still are captain of our souls. Was Winston Churchill a sea captain? Winston Churchill was the man who saved England during World War II. Come on. But, but you're walking to the crypt. How many times have you walked this route with me, Fina? Of course we're walking through the crypt. But, what? what's that? F Fina, where are you? What's wrong? Nothing, just looking. No time, gotta vote. Come on. I'm Fina Mendoza, dog walker and lady detective. The banging isn't the demon cat trying to escape and curse the Mendozas. It's just a beat up old air conditioner making noise. Nothing to be scared of. Unless I'm wrong. Unless. Fina! <laughs> Now, you have to imagine the echoes and the music and the beating on the air conditioning duct, all those sounds. We can't do them for you today, but you got to hear from these wonderful actors. Thanks, you guys. Let's do, um, let's bring the dog in. I mean, let's hear from Senator Something. And it's a scene where um, Fina and Senator Something are doing a little detecting. Be before we start, Kitty, I, I just have a question that's been on my mind. Who is the most difficult character to write uh, in this production? Well, the dog, I think, quite frankly, oh, Senator really? Something. Oh, really? Because all it says is bark, bark, bark. <laughs> <laughs> See, but this is why you only get actors who have genius in them, because they can look at that bark and know exactly the internal monologue that is going on behind that bark and bring that to the fore. So not only are you going to get it from the ASPCA, you're going to get it from the WGA. <laughs> All right, here we go. Hi. The reason I'm not looking at you is that my monitor broke and I can see myself over over there, but I can't see myself over here. So I'm going to stop looking at myself, which is the most difficult thing for an actor to do. Thank you. <clears throat> Ready. So here's what I'm thinking, Senator something. If I'm supposed to be a lady detective, I need to start detecting. I looked up Demon Cat on the internet, and there were all these stupid pictures of cats with death horns and pointy tails and bright red eyes. They look like cartoon cats. I know, right? But I did find out that in the old days, they kept cats in the Capitol tunnels to kill rats. The demon cat was supposedly the one cat that never left. So I have an idea. What do you think about returning to the scene of the crime? <laughs> We just need to nose around and look for clues. You're good at that, aren't you? <laughs> and if you do a good job, I have a special treat for you. It's the Washington Monument, a plastic. <laughs> you want to play? Oh, all right. Just for a minute. I jumped my line, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's enough. It's time to get to work. <laughs> How can I even miss my work here? Woof, <laughs> woof. I know. I don't like that statue of Caesar Rodney either. <laughs> doesn't look very nice. It's different after all the tourists go home. There's still enough light for me to make notes in my detective notebook. See, Senator something? It says DC on the cover. Everybody will think it's about the District of Columbia, but you and me are the only ones who know it's all about the demon cat. So, if I use my five senses, no unusual smells. Wait, is that a cigarette? No, not a cigarette. A cigar, like the one Tio Tom smokes. I'm not supposed to smoke in the Capitol. Cigarettes or cigars. That's an unusual smell. Well, let's try over on the Senate side of the Capitol. 
<laughs> Where are you going, Senator something? That's the court chamber. Don't be silly, Senator. There's no food over there on the floor. It's just concrete. <laughs> right, all right. Let me take a closer look. Move out of the way, you hairy pooch. What are those? Hot huh, prints? I know, I see them. More paw prints over there. Tiny, the size of a... Cat! Good boy, Senator. You must be part bloodhound. I wish I had my own cell phone. Then I could take a picture and send it to Papa. I know, I've got a pencil in my backpack. See, Senator? You take a piece of paper and put it down over the paw prints. We used to do this in third grade with leaves, except we use crayons to make autumn colors. We don't have an orange and yellow leaves in California. Did you know that, Senator something? Uh-uh, no. Uh -uh. There it is, Senator something. Real evidence. Evidence of the demon cat. <laughs> I'm going to put the evidence in my backpack. Why did you stop? Come on, Senator. I don't like hanging around the crypt any longer than I have to. Here. Behind that grate, something or someone wants to get out. I see it. That long, skinny shadow. It looks like a... Like a cat! We've got to get out of here, Senator! Come on, Senator something! I'm serious! We've got to go! This is no time to play! Yes, that's the model of, an, of the National Mall! Let's get a move on! <laughs> yes, I see! There are two Washington monuments on it. Now let's go! No, Senator! <laughs> down, Senator something! Get down! <laughs> Senator something, no, that is not your squeaky toy. Come on, Senator something. Sorry. Yes, I know you're sorry. Listen, I have a plan about the deep cat. I know Papa said to stay out of the crypt, but I have to find a way to stop our bad luck. Splattered spaghetti sauce is one thing, but breaking Abuelita's leg is serious. And what if something happened to Papa or Gabby or to me? <laughs> One way to stop the curse. The only way to stop the curse is to learn more about the demon cat. I need an expert, Senator something. Someone who knows the crypt like at the back of their hand. Someone like a capital tour guide. Oh, hmm. I have to find a way to get back in the crypt Incognito. That means in disguise. I don't want that Capitol Police woman to recognize me. I thought about wearing an eye patch or a wig or pretending that I have a limp. But I figure the best disguise is no disguise at all. <laughs> no, Senator, you can't come with me. <laughs> oh, here's the plan. I'll stand in line with all the tourists at the Capitol Visitor Center and find a bunch of students and just blend in. All the tours end in the Capitol Crypt. And when we get there... <laughs> well done, you guys. It says, where does it say there? Uh, oh, I agree. I can't, oh, it's backwards. Oh, my, my, no wonder I can't read it. My, my camera's backwards, so I'm facing the right way. It says, carb, carb. <laughs> so steve what was the challenge of being a dog <laughs> there was no challenge i just i we have a new dog a newish dog his name is charlie in fact we have him tied up in in the bedroom i just <laughs> thought what he, what he would do because he's very vocal and makes a lot of different noises so i Okay, I'll be honest. The hardest part is getting as much stuff in as I can between lines. 
<laughs> ham. I think the middle name is Ham. I'm a ham. Uh, the hard part was uh, actually trying to keep a lid on it, Kitty. I, sometimes I would go overboard. Uh, but uh, I, I'm, I had no trouble. I, I'll be honest. I had no trouble. I loved it from the beginning. I was so happy to uh, do it. And I didn't have any lines in the room. When people st stop talking, I bark, and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> And Amy, you, what was your connection to, to Fina? Like, like, you are not a kid, but you're having to play a kid. How did you really connect with her? Well, I was first introduced to the character by reading the book before I received the script. Um, and even though I am Latina, but I'm not Mexican, so there's a little bit of culture differences, there was a lot that I did relate to, you know, that I understood with the character. And at the end of the day, I also think we're all still children at heart. You know, like I'm still relatively young, like I'm in my early 20s, but I'm still very childish. And I also work around a lot of kids. So that brings out like the inner child in me. And it's a lot of fun working with kids that are like between like the ages of like six all the way to like 13. So also just seeing that helps bring out my inner child. Mm -hmm. And how is this different um, than doing a traditional like stage play? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> So different. Um, in a play, if you know you have lines and there's like people talking over each other, it's a way that it it's still balanced. Like you can cut someone off when it's written, you cut this person off. But when we were taping, we were so used to doing that on stage that the sound wasn't balanced. And so Kitty would be like, okay. So we'd have to just stop and there was always awkward pauses between the lines as like the microphone was like slowly being moved between the actors. So it was so different. So it'd be like line, pause, next person, pause, next person. So it was very slowed down. And it's also different that um, a lot of the scenes are taped um, not in chronological order. So like in a play, you go from the beginning to the end. While um, for this, you know, we, depending on when it was, like the very first scene we actually taped was the zoo scene. So that was already kind of like further into the script. And so it was just kind of bouncing all over the place. So that's how it's different. And you had something interesting in this, in the person who played your sister. <laughs> Can you tell a little bit about that? Uh, so the person that plays my sister is my cousin, and she's a year older than me, Monica Vigil. Um, she's also an actress. And so I remember seeing the script, and then Kitty was like, do you know anyone? And I was like, she's amazing. Like, I've worked with her, you know, all the time. She's the one that got me into theater and into acting. So then when I found out she was cast as my sister, I was like, this is perfect. You know, you always acted like my older sister. So the bond and the connection was already there. And I think that really comes through. Um, I didn't remember that um, Monica was your cousin uh, until we were already in taping. And the relation, I mean, you can tell these people have a relationship. They just, they know each other's, you know, foibles, the sister rivalry stuff works, the humor works. You guys get each other's sense of humor. I mean, that was a happy, happy thing that worked really well. And Amy, where, where do you think Fina would go after lockdown? Like, where would be the first thing that she would, if she could get out and go anywhere, if her dad would let her? Remember, we need parental permission first. <laughs> but, like, where would she go? For sure, she would go see Senate or something. For sure. <laughs> Aww. <laughs> and what was the, the biggest challenge for you in this part, Amy? Um, I think the biggest challenge was trying, so it does have a little bit of a more mature theme of, you know, unfortunately having lost her mother. And so trying to incorporate that very mature theme into the mind of a child. Um, I think that's something that I struggled with, especially in the scenes where I'd be talking to my abuelita and we would be talking about my mother and it would just kind of be like, well, I know how I would react as an adult, but I have no idea how a child would react to losing their parent. Um, so I think that was the biggest struggle um, through the whole thing. And I think, I think it was beautifully written. And I think Kitty gave like the best direction in how to get to that point. 
Mm. And Kitty, is it different? I, I think you, you've directed the theater stuff before. You've been involved at least in theater productions. How is something like this different than theater? It, because you're working with sound, you're not working with movement, you're not working, you know, you've really kind of, li you're not working with visuals. So really, uh, it's much more like producing a radio story in that you're really focusing on what you can hear, and what comes through emotionally, you know, through the sound. So, and when Amy said there were a lot of spaces, we only used one mic, we went from actor to actor to the actor, but we did take the spaces out, you know, so that it sounded like a normal conversation, just with a lot of editing. <laughs> Yeah, the, the day that I came in, you know, obviously because I play the teacher, I had the real kids there. Um, and I thought it was amazing that they were so, um, they were like little adults. <laughs> like they were so professional and they were so wanting to add to everything, um, like add their ideas. And they, they really brought pieces of themselves to this. It wasn't like Kitty's version of a kid. It was like these kids really did bring true childhood into this, which I thought was really interesting. Um, Raul, who is muted right now, so I don't know if we can... Oh, sorry anyone. about that. That's my fault. Um, no, he's not. Well, oh, now he is. <laughs> We're oh, playing I did it. Um, when you first heard about this project, what did you think? <clears throat> when I first heard about it, it was great because Kitty and I first met doing theater back in uh, college. And, um, of course, I've uh, heard her on the radio and, uh, over the years, and, uh, but we haven't worked together since no. then. Um, and having produced radio uh, national, uh, on a national Spanish language network, um, this reminded me of radio drama. And I still uh, love radio the most of all the media that I've ever worked with. So that was great. Uh, the fact that the story is essentially about a young Hispanic girl um, and her family in Washington, a city that I know uh, a little bit uh, because of my work in public relations and media. Uh, uh, and it's a mystery, and I love mysteries and thrillers. That's my favorite form of uh, literature. So uh, it had all the right elements. Uh, but I did go into it rather blindly. I mean, I got the script, I read it, and I said, okay, I, by coincidence, grew up in the congressional district of California that the congressman represents, the 31st, the 34th. Uh, that was my congressional district. And I've known uh, members of Congress and other elected officials since I was a teenager. So um, it was great, but it, I was really blind until we went into the first reading of the script. And it was really not only a beautiful audio experience, but it was really moving emotionally. Um, it was just such a, it just sounded so beautifully. And, and the story just came alive with these people who, for the most part, were absolute strangers sitting around a living room, uh, meeting each other for the first time. The story just really came to life. And this young girl, Fina Mendoza, um, I mean, I just fell in love with her immediately. It was kind of like seeing your, your own child for the first time. So it was great from day one uh, until today. It's just been absolutely great. I'm also running for Congress. And <laughs> <laughs> and Kitty, any final thoughts on this? Do you have any plans for future FEMA? Oh, yes. I am uh, a few thousand words away from finishing the second in the FINA series. Um, yeah, I, I think it's going to be, I don't know the title. It might be something like, you know, the Fina Mendoza Mysteries State of the Union because it takes place around that time in Washington, D.C. It kind of picks up from where this book laid, stops uh, as far as time goes. Um, and the only thing I'll tell you is that a mysterious bird poops on the head of the president during the State of the Union address. Very and so, of course, Fina has to solve that mystery. <laughs> or well, get this... more, or get more birds. I mean, it's... <laughs> Stephen, stop that. I, I am still voting for a musical. I want to do Fina the musical. <laughs> <laughs> that would be interesting. I'm out on that. <laughs> this book is Welcome to Washington, Fina Mendoza by Kitty Feldy, published by Black Rose Writing. And the free podcast is the Fina Mendoza Mysteries. It's available wherever you get podcasts, or you can listen to it online at finamendozamysteries.com. 
Special thanks to Amy Solano, Steve Devorkin, and Raul Garza for joining us today. And thanks to you, Kitty Feldy. I'm Susan Ballot. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.